This week, though, we have something very different, and as I said in emails, I promise that this will not be a traditional physics lecture. Our speaker today is not a physicist, uh, but he is a social scientist who spent a lot of time thinking about science. So Troy Campbell uh, grew up in California. One of the biographies I read pointed out that he won the science award in his high school, but he also won the award for the person most likely to join a circus. <laughs> uh, which he's very proud of. When he, by the time he got to grad school, he decided what he really wanted to do was social psychology. So he's investigated many different questions, including you know, the psychology of happiness, why people believe things that they do and don't believe things that they do. And that's taken him in several different directions into investigating basically the psychology of science and how science works and how people view science. And I hope that that's some of what he's going to talk to us about today, so, Troy. Hey, everybody. Um, so let's do this. Um, I love false starts. So before I start talking about things, I just want to do a couple things with you so we can learn some stuff about you. So who, what do you wish people didn't deny science about or resist science globally? Shout out anything. Climate change. Climate change. Right, so on our global war, right? CC. Round Earth. Earth. What? Round Earth. Round Earth. <laughs> Got a couple vaccines. Facts. All right. Anything else? These are kind of our core core. Moon landing. Lots of conspiracy. Yeah, conspiracy. Okay. Okay. So that's our global war. Uh, let's do personal stuff. So in your own life, in your own teaching, what do you wish you saw more in, let's go, a family member or a friend first? Probably pull some of those things over here right as well. <laughs> Same issue, sadly. Um, what about with your students? What do you wish was more with your students? Maybe you wish they cared more about the scientific method or something like that? Wanted them to be more critical? In, yeah, I want them to think, right? Crit thinking, right? Right, I want them to see science as cool. Um, and I also want to see science as like this everyday thing, right? It's not just this thing that we use to study black holes and the processes we study with black holes is to some degree these two things and if you practice in that you will learn, right? If you observe physics in the world, you're observing and you're ruling out explanations and you're becoming a more scientific thinker. And so what I just did is one thing I really like to do actually with my students. And so what I like to do is I teach psychology, so on the day that I teach persuasion, I say, what do you want to persuade people? I get climate change up there. On the irrationality day, it's like government, be better, empathy day, uh, get over prejudice and things like that. But then on my personal board, I like to do things, I say, what's a personal thing? And on, on different days, they're like, persuade my in-laws to like me more, gather the courage to ask a girl out, throw a lit, savage, groovy, or whatever word they're using for party at that time. <laughs> Um, and then sometimes they'll also say things like, uh, convince my brother that he actually is more awesome than he thinks. And then it gets really a little bit emotional. And what I do is I take those two boards and I slide them across from each other. And then the lecture comes right up. And I say, as in most classes, we start right in the middle of the things you know, love, and care about most. Let's use scientific findings and processes of inquiries to make better things which are so global and so personal and so important to you better. And what that does is it means that every single time we are interacting or learning with the science, it's about them. It's about who they are. And that's something that I'm going to rhyme on a little bit in something, is that pretty much everybody is always asking the question, is this me? Um, are people like me doing this, and will it be harm? OK, so that's one false start I want to do. Here's another false start um, I want to do with you guys. I want you to raise your hand, but don't raise it yet. I'm going to have two groups of people raise their hand. If you are an atheist, but you have a friend who is religious or spiritual in a belief system you don't believe, but you see that they can be very scientific 
about a lot of things. And raise your hand if you are religious, but you have a friend who's an atheist who can be scientific and rational about lots of things. So most likely that's everybody raising their hand, right? Right? Most everybody. So a couple of people holding up. Um, but in general, what the thing I want to say is that most all of us know that there are people out there who may stay fixed on one issue and never change on that issue, but be very scientific about stuff. And so there are some things that we are never going to change everybody else on, but there are spaces that we can make a lot of progress. And if we think that we can't just push somebody on one space, then we are potentially <coughs> doing the wrong thinking about stuff. All right, next, here's what I want you to do. I want you guys to think about these things. And that is the persuasion strategies that are the most popular. And so these are the three things. So uh, how is it? Ethos, credibility, pathos, emotion, and logos, logic. So, I want you guys to, you guys are logic, you guys are pathos, and you guys are ethos. I want you to take about 30 seconds in your mind and come up with an argument based in one of these rhetorical strategies, the most popular strategies that we use, to think about how you convince someone. So, I'm a scientist, I study climate change, climate change is happening. We need to change it, think of the polar bears, think of the future, and logic, We've done this, studies have been done, it has shown this, the core ice core show this, so logically this is happening and we can project this. So take about 30 seconds to think about that. <laughs> okay, here's what I want you guys to do now. Please play along. I want you guys to very loudly Shout all those things at me. So on 30 seconds, you are going to yell what you thought in your head out at me. One, two, three, yell them at me. <laughs> awesome. All right. So let us go back to the time. This is the story of a Diet Coke. Troy Campbell is about 24 years old. He has recently, a couple of years ago, taken a class with a global climate change scientist who won, was part of the IPCC, that won that report while he was in the class, and he still doesn't recycle or act environmentally in his own life. He's not denying science, but he's not acting in that part, right? People have shouted every single thing at him, and he still hasn't changed his behavior. Until one day, he meets a hot British geologist. She comes over to his house, starts speaking with that accent that's even hotter than she is somehow, and she utters a phrase that has never been uttered in Troy Campbell's graduate apartment. Where is the recycling? I had given her a Diet Coke at that time, because that's what I could afford, and there is no recycling in my house. It's not like this crazy compost thing that's going to need a PhD to figure out. <laughs> um, and so I do not have a recycling. However, I have two things, a strong desire to date this woman, and a box with a bunch of notes in it that's a cardboard box. So I go grab that cardboard box, I then go to my trash, she's not seeing me in the kitchen, pull out some Diet Cokes from the trash, put it in there, walk all the way over to her and say, I actually don't have a recycling bin, because you know on that triangle, it says reuse before recycle. Yeah. This is not to make me look good, obviously. But I like starting out the talk with this story because I like starting out with the story to say that I deny a lot of science. I'm going to tell uh, uh, something in that. But I've also taken action sometimes that I knew the science, right? I'd spent 10 weeks with a climate change scientist. I'd heard 10 years hearing all these arguments. And 10 minutes into a date with a hot British girl, that's what changed me into being the person that I wanted to be in this space. And so I'll talk about this idea that what leads us usually to change is going to be three things. A solution that is not super aversive, a social influence, a person we like who's doing the thing and we want to be a part of, and when we see it related to the self. So I make my students care about my scientists by connecting it to self things that they care about, and uh, I 
we, we will talk about the social thing, just like the um, uh, hot rice girl was for me, and then I'm going to get into the solution in a second here. And I want you to think in your head very, very simply. Is there a problem or a talent or an activity that you think is an incredibly, incredibly aversive solution, is an incredibly, incredibly thing where the people there themselves who run the cause and who are most associated with the cause, either you don't like or seem to very much dislike you, and you see as very something that is completely unrelated to who you are, right? And for most everything in the world, if it's a thing where the solution is highly aversive, the people involved with it are highly aversive, and it really isn't who you feel you are, then you're probably going to be very unlikely to engage in that, and you might even deny it, right? If you're not good at soccer, if you don't understand soccer, you don't watch soccer, and you might even do great soccer and say it's a sport that shouldn't be. These different things. So, we're going to get into this. Let me tell you, oh, let me do my one last false intro here, which is that here's how I like to see myself as a social scientist communicating with you guys. I'm double, I'm Q, and you're 007. That is, I'm Q, you're James Bond. So what that means is you guys all have your different missions in life, right? You guys all have your missions in life when you're teaching, when you're involved in activism, whatever you're doing, and they're all very different, and I don't understand your missions, and I probably don't have the ability to succeed in your missions. Like, I couldn't explain and convince to people the basics of physics. But, what I hopefully can do is this talk is you coming into my lab and me giving you some tools to help you on the amazing things you do. So hi, I'm Troy. I'm a psychologist that did memory and uh, irrationality things. I'm at the University of Oregon now. I used to be a Disney Imagineer. Um, I also work for these companies. I'm involved in activism and I work with this company on inclusion initiatives. I do research on identities and beliefs. Um, so why people deny things, sort of what I've been talking, and also uh, what makes people enjoy things. And I pretty much believe at the basis that if we understand very basic things about human psychology, we can design everything better, whether that's a day at Disneyland, or whether that's a social movement, or whether that's getting people involved in class. And I hope some of these tools can help you. And no, we're not going to go through the psychology of the Disney ride inside. But if you want to talk to me over there, you can. All right. Celeste. So a longish time ago, it's a serious story, but it has happy. A longish time ago, 14 years old, I'm on the third floor of a building in my home county, Orange County, Southern California. Beautiful late August summer day, looking out the window, I should be super happy. Because in front of me, in the distance, is Disneyland, my beloved. Below me is Starbucks, my other beloved. And behind me, a couple miles is the beach. But I'm not, because right here on the side of me is my doctor, diagnosing me with an extreme nexus of problems, hypoglycemia, and thyroid He's explaining it's why I've been incredibly depressed all summer, and I'm at risk for immediate and very much long-term health consequences. And in my own microcosm of science denial, I immediately deny what the expert has said. Don't think I have to my couch. Do you want? Cool. Yeah. Um, of what I've said. Of what he said. <clears throat> and here's the thing. Right now, this man has been the best practitioner of science. He has solved an issue that is wrong with me. But he really hasn't solved it because I'm denying it. He's been great at the science. It is late August. I have been depressed as hell going to every single doctor. And he's the first one who's actually identified what's wrong. But at this moment, he needs to figure out why is it I'm denying this issue? I deny it because I'm going to feel like I'm going to be super sick at age 32? No. What is going on? Why am I denying it? 
though silly as it seems, is I know exactly what the solution is. That I'm going to have to give up one of my favorite single things at that time. And that is this. <laughs> <coughs> Frappuccino from Starbucks. And you giggle, that's fine. Um, but this thing was an elephant on my forehead that was not letting any of the factual information get in. Right? And this is silly, obviously. But it was actually really important to me. It was a wonderful thing that tastes great, and it was how I felt normal. I'd actually had really extreme allergies to food intolerances until I was 12 years old. And then I grew out of them, and then combined with a diet changing which revealed new problems with me and adolescent onset issues, I now couldn't have things like this, which I'd first been able to have only two years ago. And I'd spent my entire life going to parties, bringing my own food, including fake-ass Oreo cookies, by all the kids judged. Kids, Southern California kids, Americans, are cruel. So I was dealing with something that my colleagues and I would later do research on called solution aversion. We deny a problem often not because we're actually scared of the problem itself, but because of what the solution means. It's going to be a tangible thing, maybe it's an identity implication, and my doctor had to figure this out. Uh, Obama's regulatory czar, Kassel and called this paper one of the most important, unoverlooked things in understanding uh, modern problems in politics. And so luckily, my doctor, Dr. Manuel Fernandez, uh, was able to diagnose me with the right medical condition, but because he'd asked so many questions ahead of time, he figured out what was bothering me. I was excited that I could eat these new foods. I was excited to be a normal kid. I was sad that I wasn't being able to connect with people. And he understood sort of what it was, and was able to explain to me that I could have a diet that would be normal at least sometimes if I maintain a constant eating of healthy foods for every two hours. And I still have to do that. Actually, if I don't eat, uh, every about three or four hours, I can literally become the depressed kid that I was in 14, but I can also have a Starbucks. And I'm a healthy and happy person today because of this man, because he was a great scientist, but also he was a great lay psychologist. And so what solution aversion is, is it's an example of something where the implication of the fact itself affects what we actually think about the fact. Here the implication is the solution. Sometimes I call this implications management. We have a problem, and people deny that problem. And we deny that problem because sometimes, you know, they're scary, they're depressing, they're morbid, they're apocalyptic, they're soul-crushing, or they're depressing, the problem itself. But oftentimes, almost every single problem is associated with a solution. And that solution can itself be aversive. I don't want to drive this. Don't make me eat this. This is against my identity. <clears throat> Do not hate this. I hate this. Oh, I hate this more. There's nothing more. If you say we can solve a problem with anything, uh, this is the thing I hate more. I don't know. I hate this even more, right? And so you end up denying these problems. And so we've done a lot of research. We can explain some things related to climate change denial about how certain people uh, are averse to certain solutions. And remember, lots of people aren't averse to these solutions, so they have they don't even detect that even in themselves, right? The Californians are like, oh, that's a great car to drive, all the cool and environmental my friends. I love kale. I love yoga and mindfulness taxes. Oh, government is cool, don't you believe it into a wallet is a god. Um, right? And so and so we in that space. The metaphor that I like using this with Disneyland is that Disney. Um, we can use this metaphor, is that Disney has the best rides in the world, arguably, some of the best rides in the world, um, and science has the best facts in the world. But Disney knows that even having the best rides isn't going to be good if the solution is difficult, right? If the lines are long and you can't get on the rides, uh, I mean, just even if the line is long itself or the par park feels dirty, you're unlikely to go there. So Disney knows it is as important for them to make the great ride as it is to make sure the lines are manageable and they're doing so much to do that and the park feels like not just the happiest place on the earth but the safest place on the earth, which is why it is so much more successful than that dirty park with six flags up the road of France. Um, so um, I just want to pause before I get into the other things to say 
I think that it is, I think that what sometimes people have in their mind, the elephant on their forehead here, the solution to version people actually have themselves, is that what I'm saying to you is you as a physicist need to become an expert psychologist in order to accomplish all of your things. I don't think that's the case. I think that there's a lot of small little tools that you can use in your own situation. And I also think that at a university, uh, wherever we are, or at an activist group, we should have a group of people whose job it is to really make things uh, wonderful, right? So we should have uh, educational specialists at colleges to help bring alive a physics activity. Like maybe you have a certain idea about how you can use a basketball in the classroom to engage people, because people love basketballs more than whatever random example you have, and you can have somebody help design that thing. Um, so yeah, that is solution aversion. Let us get into the next. Just all right, so since we're talking about Disney, I want to talk about the next thing uh, that might be interesting to talk about, which is that I want to talk about Disney's great story structure and how it is one of the most powerful ways to potentially lead to change. And that is this. Let me give you a background on the science of story around Disney. In good stories, characters change. In great stories, the greatest of our time, the most memorable, the most popular movies of our age, Star Wars, Marvel movies, Disney movies, The Matrix, to the classic stories, whether the religious stories, the Monkey King story, the Magia. In those stories, the characters don't just change. They change into who they were always meant to be. Luke always had the force inside of him. The princess was always the princess. And this very, very simple idea that characters change into who they were always meant to be is one of the reasons we really, really like those stories, because we like authenticity. People should be who they are. But also, it's one of the most effective persuasion strategies. We like when we or other people become who they were always meant to be or they feel it should be. One of the things we use in marketing all the time is that we tell people they already are the people you want them to be. What's your name? Emma. Hi. I'm Troy. I'm a little new to you. Um, Emma, if I was trying to sell makeup to you, I probably wouldn't go up to you and say, Emma, you are ugly. You are fake. You are terrible. Right? Um, if I was trying to sell science to you, I wouldn't say, you are an idiot. Or maybe I would, that's the point, right? You are an idiot, you know nothing, all your theories are wrong, right? What I would do if I would effectively sell products to you is to go up to you and say very simply, you are beautiful, and you have an inner goddess inside of you. And if you take my product, the true, most beautiful version of you will emerge, right? That's how we sell products. Disney does it in this way. They don't even talk about their products in lots of the commercials for the park. They go up to you and they say, you have a Disney side inside of yourself. Right? You like one of the characters in that movie. And you are not being your full self if you don't go to the parks and let out your Disney side. And that idea of approaching you as if you are already part of us, as if you're already inside of you, is what's very useful. So in the very first class that I teach in psychology, I always tell my kids, um, I don't see you guys as not being good at this. I already see you guys as being good at this, right? We've talked about in this warm up activity that you can see the reason that people like things. I see you guys like Luke Skywalker in episode four. You already have the force inside of you, and my job is to be Yoda to bring out a talent that is already inside of you. Right? So instead of going up to people and saying, you aren't this, now change your entire self and be this, you're saying you already are this to some degree, and here is a way in which you can change, and you can change to be more natural yet. In our inclusion workshops we do with companies like Apple and Nike, the very first thing we always do is we try to find one way that you yourself are already inclusive, right? So we find some way, maybe you don't think of it as inclusion, but you walk around and you talk to everybody at least once a month in your office space. So Karen, you've never thought of um, that is an inclusive activity, but actually you're very inclusive. Um, or you already are that to some degree. So all the things we're teaching you, you're just going to become more of who 
who you already are. Um, so here's the Disney side commercials. They have this really cute commercial where they have somebody walk by this thing and then they have a character who looks at this, right? Oh, frumpy businessman, he has a, not frumpy businessman, handsome businessman, um, he's got a goofy side, right? And all these people have these different ways. So the focus is, this is already who you are to some degree. And so the lesson here is you want to sometimes tell people they already are the people you want them to be, and that you want them to change in ways um, uh, um, that they're going to be this way. Uh, uh, let's pause on that. All right, so we've gone through these two parts so far right here, which is one is we know the solution is going to be seen as aversive and that will sometimes turn people off. And we've also gone through this idea over here that if you don't feel that this is what you are, this is who you are, you're unlikely to do that, right? If I go up to someone and I say, you've never recycled You've always denied science. Now change everything and be on this. That's not going to be that great. Last thing I want to talk about um, before I start bringing all the steps together is um, a principle uh, the, my colleagues and I call start with care. And the idea behind this is that so much time, so many times that we are in certain situations, it seems as if the people who are running the causes the people who are teaching our classes, the people who are the politicians, they don't care about us, right? That they're trying to derive all their trust from saying that they have the ability and that they don't really care about what's going on, right? They haven't heard what I'm interested in. They don't know anything about me. They're just walking on stage and starting to teach. They're walking on stage and they're saying, hey, I've got a plan. I'm going to give you health care. My name's Hillary Clinton. I'm writing about everything. There's a health care plan, but also I think that you or at least half of your friends are deplorable, right? And that, that way in which we come off sometimes is we have this appeal to our ability, but not our care. I'm going to hit in part and say it's really kind of sucky that we have to do this. Um, but the idea behind this is we are showing that we care about the people themselves who we are going into. Right? And so um, hopefully that sort of establishes that at the start. But we want to show care, especially for people who think that they might, that we might, really dislike them. So why is it that the flat earthers, why is it that the conspiracy theorists, why is it that the alt-right in the United States is often so successful with people that seem sort of normal? And one of the reasons is, is those people seem more loving to the people who they are recruiting, right? Right? There's videos all over, all over the mainstream media. If you believe vaccinations don't work, you are an idiot and I hate you. Right? The, the famous comedians are saying that thing, right? That is not at all showing care towards that person. Again, do I sort of agree, at least with the first two sentences of that? Yes. And I'm not saying exactly what we should do in all these situations, but I want to throw out um, some of these things here. Yet, when the alt-right and the flat earthers and the conspiracy theories see people, they say, I get how you're feeling. I get that other people aren't listening to you. That's not right. right? When Trump comes to his audiences, he often, people often say that Trump isn't nice um, or that Trump isn't empathetic to People. And he's not empathetic to a lot of people, but so much of what he says is, I believe that lots of America is not listening to you right now. Here's how I am listening to you. I see you as America. You are the America that has been forgotten. Let's make America great, which I'm really saying is, I want you to be included. Right? And everybody, what they do is they attack Trump. They attack Trump 
And they realize, they don't realize that the thing that they never do is they just hate on Trump rather than caring for the people who are actually voting for him. There is very little start with care, at least for the audiences that we are trying to convince. And so in certain situations, it kind of plays out like this, and it's a weird battle that we're fighting. Team science is fighting a very weird battle. It is a battle that we only win, we only win when lots, not all, but lots of the people who we disagree with, who we see as on the opposite team to us, join us. And that type of battle is a very, very different type of battle to fight. Right? That's the type of battle that you have to grease the wheels and make the solution seem easier than they think it is. And lots of times people see the solutions to problems as much more extreme than they are. Climate change may be a exception to that. They see that the people hate them in the group, so how can we fix that? And they see that they themselves don't belong there in that situation. Um, so let me give one example of a group that's killing it at this. So I just want to point out this. Um, what we find in our research is that people are much more uh, relate to people who have recently changed rather than people who have been doing it all the time. So some of the people that we like highlighting uh, are the people that are changing. And one group that sort of gets um, at that idea um, uh, is this group. Um, And that, they're called exposure labs. And so what they do is they make these wonderful movies. And uh, they know when they make these movies, they don't actually bring up the issue of climate change till like mid in the movie because they want people watching it and being like, look at how awesome this is. This is good. We want to save it. We want to identify with all these cool things before we bring in the sadness. But the thing that they really do that's really well done is when they take the movies on the road, and they do so many of this, the director, right, award-winning director shows up and talks to certain audiences, start with care. And then they, once they do that, they rally the troops and they have more people. And then eventually they get two screenings like this. And at those screenings, at these larger screenings, they give everybody an immediate opportunity to contribute. So you can immediately join Team Hero. And here's, here's for instance, hi Pat, I'm a big fan and supporter of you, a conservative. Um, I hope you support this effort. I'm a believer in climate change, right? Finding a way for this man uh, to do it. And so this formula for success, sometimes uh, to call it activism, is rally, rally, change. Which is that what we often want to do is we want to rally the choir, grow the choir, and then bring in people. And it's really this time that we're actually leading to change because these people are coming in with their friends and their mind is being changed because they're coming into a welcoming space because they're coming with their friends, right? And they're, they're saying there are ways to engage with this solution that are going to be enjoyable and lead to good outcomes. Your friends are here and they're supporting you and we're going to give you a way to immediately uh, appeal and engage in this so we're going to welcome you into Team Hero so this feels like you and you're already now sort of good at the cause. And they're managing that solution aversion, that social aversion, and those self uh, aversion issues. Um, so I have quite a few other things that I can get to, but I kind of like taking a pause at this moment because uh, to ask if anybody has uh, any questions or any concerns. Well, this seems overwhelming. So some of the solutions to climate change are, are people are averse to. People are averse to, and the actual solutions, yeah. So sometimes I say that climate change, when we talk about science denial and science activism, is sometimes not a perfect analog for a lot of other situations, because it has a literally ticking clock on it in ways that other issues don't. 
right? If, the, if we don't act now, um, we could reach you know, a threshold point that we can't come back for. But for other types of things, um, that's not the case. And so, um, and that. And so potentially what you can't manage in, in climate change are solution aversions, but you can manage other things, like your team is on it. Look, there's a bunch of farmers who are more your type of people doing it. Look, you've already been doing many ways to engage in it. And so if you can meet them through social forces and self forces, you can um, have a lot of accomplishment. That being said, Climate change is insanely, insanely difficult if some of the most powerful people in the world are saying that and have a news media organization that immediately responds in a pretty effective way to any new strategy. So sometimes I kind of just, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull the let's not talk about climate change that much for the rest of the talk because I feel like it distracts away from all the other places that it's actually much easier to get away. The thing I'm, I'm hearing here is that uh, I'd be more effective communicating science if I didn't first tell people that they're stupid. I have the opposite problem completely, I think. And that uh -huh. is, most of the time that I'm explaining oh, my experience in public science, my prejudice is they all can get it and do it and so forth. And people tell me it's the first thing I fail. Uh -huh. Fifth grade math or yeah. something. So it's, it's the opposite to this kind of I come into it thinking people are actually good at this and will completely get it mm -hmm. and hear back from them instead. Some history of being told. So, um, so, so I don't think I'm bringing that with me, is what I'm saying. But, but I do need to cope with this issue of. The code, so, the, so in that situation, we can imagine to, so the thing is we have a person and they, you believe they can get it, yeah. but they believe they can't. That's a super common yeah. uh, uh, science dilemma. Yeah, and so in that situation, our job is to build that confidence, right? Our job is to day one, if we can, I mean, it's not, tech, it, it, in an ideal world, it shouldn't be in our job, right? In an ideal world, we should have people come up here and talk, and people should know it's important and we should. But we live in a very unideal world, and in an unideal world, an unideal solution is potentially necessary. And so the ways that we can think about this is how can we engage in many different ways to um, make sure that people don't get into that mindset. And so a couple ways to do that. In general, one of the ways we like to do it at the business school where people in finance and marketing, I'm like, I'm a numbers person, I'm a creative person, is we, we like to remove that conversation completely, right? Everybody has talents and everything, and everybody's creativity will be a little bit better when they understand the number strategy, and everybody's strategy will be a little bit better when they work on their creativity here. We try and delete this idea of that as much as we can. Um, when we're coming to an audience, though, that has been told that they themselves aren't that thing, um, then our potentially what we really want to do is, is get them feeling like they are, right? So what is it that we can do in a different conversation to get that situation, right? So um, if you're talking to somebody who needs to go on a diet, you might say, well, you, you really are into athletics. And so there's one way in which you already are healthy. This is a way that is consistent with that diet um, uh, that diet behavior. Um, in a classroom setting, uh, it's really trying to make those first couple of days um, uh, ways that build their confidence in the issue rather than learn. Uh, so when I teach my psychology class, which is pretty complicated in the way that they have to apply the principles, I say the very first week, nothing in the class will be tested upon um, unless it comes back. And what I do is I do really fun interactions with things that they already love, where they take something they're really familiar with and they explain it, so it's something they're comfortable with. I teach them some terms, and then they take Snapchat, which they're really good at, and they go to the museum and they identify different ways that an area is appealing to identity, that's creating a sense of space, and, they, and, and so they leave at that end of the week feeling confident, and then anything that I ever say to them later in class is at least somewhat familiar with something that they did in the first week. 
And so it's the sense that they just feel good at the thing. And also what we know from research is the enjoy able effect. So enjoy able is the idea that when something is fun or enjoyable, we also think we are better at it. So if you use a more fun engaging activity, that actually makes the people feel better at the thing, which builds their confidence for things in the future. And of course, this thing is far easier to do in a class where you're teaching the science of Disneyland um, some of the times, but there are ways that you can find this in certain other spaces. And so that's sort of gets at, but I can, I can get some more. So from an activism perspective, um, lots of times asked to sort of reduce the strategy into sort of uh, a, the most parsimonious thing for activists. Um, and if I think we want to do that, it's reducing it to get adjacent, get local, and play the long game. And so what that means is, when we're getting adjacent, so for the American example, if you're trying to change somebody's belief on a spectrum um, around some issue, there's people who are totally on your board and are willing to storm companies and blow up things all the way to people who will never believe it and will watch um, a certain cable news program for 10 hours every day, right? So there's this spectrum, and lots of times what I think uh, activists do is they try to target these people right here, rather than target just the adjacent next movers. And when you target these people and you can get those people to change, it can cause a snowballing effect, which we've seen in things like gay rights activism, down to at least some of the people um, behind here. And so what we're doing is we're targeting the most adjacent person to our cause. The other thing is we get local in the sense that people who are local, friends, peers, are the people who are most likely to um, convince other people uh, to do that. So one of the ways that I convince my students to believe in what I'm teaching them is I actually have a student who seems just like this normal, you know, at the University of Oregon where I am, very sporty school, some bro student who would not seem like the person that would be super in Detroit's artsy science class, explain how he used that type of things he learned in his class to get a job at Adidas. And so, I the very, very first homework, they watched a video of a kid who said, I never thought this would be really interesting to me, but I got, I did really well in Troy's class, and I submitted the final project to Adidas, and now I work on shoes at Adidas, and they said that the reason I got the project was largely because of this final project showing my ability to critically think around data and issues. And so what I'm using is somebody who is more local to my students than myself um, to convince them. Um, the other thing is playing the long game. So when we plant a seed, the joke is never underestimated, the, the sort of quote on you know, Instagram that you see a million times in a million different ways, um, never uh, underestimate how much it can, how much influence planting a seed uh, can be. And the idea behind this is, of course, is I imagine that very, very few of us have ever radically changed our beliefs after learning something that we at least have been resistant to in one conversation, right? Um, uh, so for when I was younger, I was told, uh, told not to say that's gay so many times, and I kept saying that's gay all the time, um, right? And because in that conversation when I was insane, I'm like, I'm smarter than you, I'm a cocky young person, I, you aren't my peer group. People like me know it's okay. South Park did an episode that says it's fine, right? It's okay, right? And then eventually, I heard enough from those people that there was this moment that I was in a conversation where somebody said it, and I'm like, holy shit, that is a mean thing to say. And it was me understanding it after this, and me becoming the hero in the situation. Um, so in this situation, I was learning the thing, I was the student, and I was sort of resistant, but over time, because I had this thing in my head, I was able to uh, find that way and act and stuff. Another way that that can work sometimes is I like to say sometimes that there's a time for the middle finger, there's a time for a protest, there's a time for storming freeways and stuff like that, but there's also a time for open arms. There's a time for the middle finger, there's a time to put away, there's time for open arms. 
Two lessons around that is one, we often have our middle finger out when we don't think it's out, right? I'm not telling you directly you're horrible, but I'm saying that the biggest problem of all time is sort of being caused by people who are like you, you're not good at this, and the solution is something you're very averse to, that's quite a middle finger. But in this situation here with the over time, the idea here is that Sometimes the people who give the middle finger and the people who have the open arms can be different people. Um, so at least in activism, if people storm the freeways and we learn about things like how to use the right pronoun, what the science on uh, climate change is, that that um, autism vaccination study was wrong. We hear it from this person, and then later we're talking to a friend, later we're talking to a person of open arms, now you're a person who knows that thing, and if this person in the cause is nice and more accepting, then all of a sudden you can join Team Hero via them. And so even if we have an argument with someone and it doesn't work on day one, it doesn't mean that over the long term it won't work um, with some different strategy. Um, right, that has some great, yeah, yeah. 
Um, uh, Google it and feel bad about life. Um, um, I love you, Netflix. Rehire me next year. Um, uh, uh, but um, so what I would do in that situation is I would say the culture um, around anti-vax and goop lab stuff is about um, feminism. It's about mindfulness. It's about um, and it's about motherhood. So that those are the spaces that most of that stuff uh, happens. You have people who have direct links into that, and I would use one of those links to get into that, right? And so you're going to want to bring somebody in there who I really care about the health of my children. I really care about um, being this hippy dippy mindfulness study thing from a scientific perspective, and here's why I think the the goop lab stuff. Um, is not, and that's that's how I would go about it. And I'd probably go at a rally, rally, change version, which is I would get a couple people who um, would be really into you know taking on new lab or anti vaxxers in that community. I'd have a small event, I'd then have a larger event to rally up enough people that would have ties, and then I'd have them bring in their different people who are connected to them, and that's potentially when we start that. Um, so yeah, so the point is solving these solutions is insanely difficult and takes resources in lots of situations, especially at the activism level. Definitely. Yeah, like I sort of related to you know, like you didn't really mention social media yet until mm -hmm. now. And I mean, I'm wondering if, if social media has sort of made it more difficult to reach people or you know, there's like fake news and all that kind of stuff. I think it's like it's to... So social media social media has a problem of echo chamber. But it's also made it easier to reach people. So what I wish the scientific community had more activism or direct um, engagement around is the way that the alt-right does. The alt-right, uh, there's this guy named Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you guys know him. He's a kind of a conservative philosopher that is called, that is often referred to as the gateway drug into the alt-right. He's Canadian. And, oh, yeah, he's Canadian. You guys know his name. Uh, yeah. Right, and so if you go on and you, so a kid watch a kid a guy watches a Jordan Peterson movie and he feel a, a talk, um, and he feels really he feels something about it. He'll comment in the section, right? And then the alt right will swoop in and they'll start responding to him and being like, "Yeah, isn't it crazy? Yeah, Jordan Peterson saying that, but if you checked out this crazy thing, right?" And then they get them, right? And that strategy, that individual caring strategy, is often very very. Uh, done in it, right? When the lots of people in the scientific community respond and be like, "Idiot! Here's the here's the here's the press release on the actual research. Look at this or something like this." Of course, that's not always the case, um, but that uh, that is often how it's done. And so, a lot of the like sort of uh, grass level activism groups around inclusion and stuff, they have adopted sort of they've tried to adopt the alt rights techniques in getting people to do the opposite in these certain situations. Um, so social media allows you to hit people one on one, and if you hit people one on one, that can be really, really useful, rather than just like a uh, Bill Nye destroys the Ark Museum, right? Um, uh, because that that is the opposite of start with care, right? Um, it still has definitely a place. There's a time for the middle finger, um, but that. But again, at the end of the day, the answer and the frustrating answer to, of course, this is it really is so many of the solutions are personal. And it's personal in the sense of activists need to identify individual targets, individual people. And sometimes, if professors had more of the resources, they could take the time to actually have a conversation with certain students and learn what is. Um, interesting to them. So one strategy that I use, again, it's easy because I get to teach a site class and I have less than 50 people in most of my classes, is on the very first day I walk in and I look like this and one third of the kids love me because they also have an exclusive sneaker and they think my Warby Parker glasses are cool and I know who those kids are because I can literally see their outfits and I do not talk to them uh, because I know they're on my team. And um, they're just like, Troy's cool. Um, I wish I had as expensive sneakers as he did, right? Um, are those and, Nikes? Uh, no, these are Adidas. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, these, these are special shoes that I will not talk about. Um, I will not talk about. Um, and so I'll, I'll find the people who I don't, who don't.
don't. And I'll go up to them and talk to them. And one of the first things I have them do in my class is I have them write their name and one thing they love, right? One thing they think is awesome. And I'll ask them about that thing. If I don't know anything about it, I'll Google it really quick on my phone and I'll go up and I'll, I'll talk to them. And then the other thing that I do is um, I put up on the board, um, I'll show you this. So again, I know how ridiculous this all is, but um, you can backtrack it. Um, uh, let's see. So I put this up on the board in my first class, um, which is this. Hi, I'm Troy, and I love consuming things. Um, and I talk about there's dark side for consuming, but we're going to stay positive in the first class. And then I say, here's a bunch of things I love. And I put this up on the screen, and every single kid in the entire class now has something in common with me that is really, really on his heart strength. Right? And so this kid knows that I care about the thing that is most important to him. Right? And as a kid, if you like Rick and Morty, you literally like Rick and Morty and you think it is the greatest thing that has ever been invented. Right? This cartoon is what they do. And if I am aware of that, um, they like that. And of course, different people have different abilities to do this and stuff, but the way that you um, communicate um, and stuff like that, right? If you wore a shirt like that to the first day of class, people would, like, half of your class would be like, oh, cool, he likes graphic tees, right? And they'd, 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 they'd be connecting to you on that piece and stuff. Most of um, never heard of the parents that are, because they're old. Yeah, <laughs> but, you're, but you're, you're referencing an aesthetic that, they're, that, they, uh, that they like in that sense. Um, so I know this is a silly, stupid thing, but psychology is silly, stupid things like this that needs to be on. Can I ask a different question, which is, do you, I mean, do you have a feeling for how good people are at knowing that you have a strategy that you're giving them? Mm -hmm. Or are they unaware of, because if you're too overt, yeah. mm -hmm. they go, oh, I can see what he's doing, yeah. and then it doesn't work. So how, how good are people at knowing that there's a strategy being given them? Um. I mean, Mark could have a plan in his class that goes, oh, I wasn't good at physics in high school either, and I am the second. And they would all go, oh, that guy's up here. Yeah, um, yeah, so, uh, so I, I, I think about that a lot, right? So how do, you, uh, how do these strategies not just look like um, BS, right? Um, and so you can think through it, right? So for instance, one of the things is if you're, so, from an activism perspective, you don't say, here is one farmer who's on our side, right? You show them thousands of farmers, right? So there is more legitimacy to that. I mean, in my case, I literally have a kid who got a job at sneaker design, um, and he looks like a bro, um, so it's pretty convincing. And um, I know details about these things, so they're there. And I, I take times to establish that I, I am sacrificing to teach them, right? And I don't think our students realize that, right? I tell them, like, I could be working on a project for Netflix right now. Um, I could be doing uh, this research and these things, but I take time in this class because I really, really believe in it. And that works for most of them. Yeah, uh, one question. When do you think the time is for the no finger approach? Because like, <laughs> the empathetic approach obviously seems effective to me, but I can feel how that can work. Mm -hmm. like, when is the aggressive thing? When is it the aggressive? So, so one of the things is sometimes you can give the middle finger and the open arms at the same time, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, uh, and religion does this. Um, so the idea is that you can, the, my favorite phrase that somebody used one time is you can only guilt the quiet. So if somebody, you can make somebody feel like they're on your team and you like them, you then can also kind of scold them sometimes, right? So if I tell my students, you're really smart, you're really, I'll just do this because it's ridiculous. Um, I'm going to this later today. So I actually have a rap in my class where I, um, I tell the students and I get them to, uh, to understand things at different levels. 
and I say, you guys care about critical thinking, I get them all to that spot. And then what I want to do is I want to convince them to read. And I say, but isn't it scary that some of you have been to the library and never checked out a book that wasn't starring Harry or sexy vampire or fairy, and then you have the balls to say Hermione is your favorite. Yeah, we all say Hermione is our favorite. She is so iconic. Could loving her be any more ironic character to find how much you thought and read, and this culture would do anything else instead. So when we talk, when we chat, we have no book, no backing to intelligently discuss. I mean, I love Harry Potter, but Hermione would be disappointed in us. And right, and since I've established the credibility, if I know that you are this type of person, what I'm positioning them as is this thing, this thing that I'm asking you to do, you know it's wrong because it's in opposition to something that you said was your core thing to do. So one of the best ways to give the middle finger to them is to establish, is position that thing as this thing is opposite of what you want to do. Now that is a very specific situation where we build a choir. Um, uh, the other time that you want to give the middle finger is that if your cause is just completely unknown, giving the middle finger can lead you to have more publicity, and that itself you need to get up to this level before you backtrack it. So I'll just make a, a joke. Uh, Kim Kardashian is famous for a reason that we all know, right? That thing elevated her into the public eye, which then she was able to, um, to uh, leverage her fame to do something else with that is much more societally appropriate. Um, sorry, Black Lives Matter, but I'm going to compare you to, to Kim Kardashian. Black Lives Matter shuts down a bunch of freeways, gets really, really intense, radical, raises the issue, same thing I think with the Me Too movement, and then after that, then clarifies, not necessarily backtracks, but clarifies, and does start shutting down as many freeways, and so this middle finger gets you here, but then um, by the time you're, but then by the time you have enough publicity, then you have to do a different thing in that situation. So those can be those can be ways to leverage the middle finger in different ways. Maybe a last question, Maybe. and then I'm sure try to answer more questions. But Brett, Brett was shyly putting up his hand. <laughs> um, so this is sort of a two part, but. In these topics you have on the board, like vaccinations and round earth and climate change, in some sense, the one-on-one -on -one approach is very expensive. Yep. Mm -hmm. And to many people, those are completely disconnected things. So in other words, you have to solve the anti-vaccination thing by mobilizing an army to solve the anti-vaccination thing and then repeat the whole process yeah. for climate change. Whereas in some sense, if you can get the leveraging of critical thinking over here, yeah. mm -hmm. then you can apply, in principle, the same methods to all of those things. But then it drops back to what facts case are they even if you talk to somebody critical thinking, they can only work off their fact base. So um, it seems to me that, that that makes it really hard to educate people on critical thinking as a way to find truth if they don't if they're snowed under this polarized fact base and you don't know how to start the critical thinking project. Yeah. Um, so there's no way to fully answer that question very quickly, so here are some thoughts. So I'm just going to answer it this way. I think, at least in the United States of America, our education system... Okay, actually, let me answer this and then I'll rant on education to end. That'll be a fun thing. Um, uh, one is, what we really want people to do is we, is we want people to, for lack of a better word, and this is kind of crazy, we want people to trust people associated with higher education, right? Right. It's not just the facts that we want people to get critical out on it, it's to some degree we want people to have somewhat of a deference to when UBC or Harvard or Stanford says something, they agree with it. So to some degree what we want people is not only to be critical thinkers, but to see themselves as part of Team Harvard, Team Stanford, Team UBC, um, which 
they often do not see themselves as part of, right? Because for, for a million different reasons. And that's a hard thing to think about how you actually do, but that is to some degree an additional component of the critical, uh, in, in, outside of critical thinking. Um, on critical thinking, I just think that we really, really need to just, at least in the United States of America, I won't speak for Canada, but I imagine you can relate to this, is I would totally gut everything about intro classes and things like that. I would get into high schools, but, I, but if we're just talking about the college level, this is how most kids in the United States of America begin college. Professor comes up to a huge 500 person lecture. All right, everybody, we're gonna talk about the meaning of life. I know you can't write a topic sentence and you've never heard of if-then statements, but I want you to write on the meaning of life for the first essay, and then for the second essay, I want you to pick something that you have a really strong conviction about and write an argumentative essay. And by the way, if you argue well enough, there's no wrong answer. And by the way, we don't have any time to edit any of your things, right? And that is to some degree how many, many colleges start, and that we don't really, really teach people how to critically think, and we actually empower almost the opposite of that is what we walk in is this huge empowerment of you're 18, your opinion matters, and we don't sort of really uh, rein that in and help them to do that. So um, what I would try to do is I'd, I'd have two strategies in that thing is how can we get people to feel like they are on Team Stanford and Harvard in certain outreach ways, which is sort of welcome to Team Hero, more involvement in these things, more start with care as a large initiative, which would cost $500 million if I'm thinking about what I'm thinking. Um, and then uh, I would also re-gut education at the start so people actually sort of get these scientific thinking in their mind so they simultaneously are better at understanding science and guessing at certain things, but then they also see themselves as having the type of thinking or being familiar with the type of thinking that the, that the Stanfords and Harvards have so that they would pay deference to them in the future. It's very complicated. Yeah, well, I would agree. I mean, then they have a shared philosophy of yes. this is how truth is discovered. Yes. Right? And they understand that that person is not just some other yep. camp. Mm -hmm. we're, we're all together trying to find yep. through a, a method. Yeah. And, um, and just, here's, here's what I would say at the very end, and this could not be a more business professor way to end. So then I don't think climate change applies to this. But if you are a business, and every year you have 3% growth, and you are an established business, that is very good. If we as a cause, science, every year have 3% growth, and in so many situations I do think we have 3% growth, um, then we technically are doing very well for what a business would be doing, and this is a very, very long game and no business ever gets the entire market. And sort of that's a very like sad way to conclude a talk, but it also is a realistic way to say, you are part of a huge enterprise of science. You will die before we know everything about science, but you will also die before we've made everybody scientific but you are progressing knowledge forward at an incremental rate, we can also progress the scientification of the public at an incremental rate. And that is the best we can do. And if we can do that mission well, then we've done what we are here to do. Thank you.